Turn with me to Mark chapter, Mark chapter 4. As I said before, it is good to be back um, preaching here in, with you. Sometimes uh, it is nice to have what we have done before, what I have done, had growing up at times when you have a, a little family meeting or something like that. Um, usually whenever dad or would say wanted a family meeting, that usually didn't mean something good. Um, but I want to just take a few minutes before I get into the text of scripture this morning to have a little family meeting with you, our, our family. It's not bad though, okay? Simply as I wanted to express to you some, uh, something God has done in my life over the last couple of weeks, something God has been working in my life, and maybe encourage you that way. I am your, whether you like it or not, whether I like it or not, I am your God-given authority uh, in spiritual things especially. I am the, the pastor of the church that God has led here. But at the same time, I am just like you. Uh, we are no different because we have the same flesh. We have the same Spirit of God dwelling within us, and we have the same struggles. Um, and God has really worked in my heart and kind of encouraged me in a certain area I wanted to share with you, just kind of as a testimony to how God has worked in my life. Maybe you can take some encouragement from it as well. Uh, sometimes it, I get really frustrated with the sanctification process. And sometimes, I know that I don't want to offend anybody's sensibilities, sometimes I get frustrated with your sanctification process. <laughs> and sometimes I get really frustrated with my sanctification process. And it does tie into what we're looking at in Mark chapter 4 this morning. But I, you know, in the past I did have somewhat of a strange idea. Um, it's not like a aha a moment I had necessarily, just kind of an encouraging moment I had as I was listening to some preaching in the car. Uh, my wife loves that, that whenever we travel, I just, I have my MP3 player and I have prepared for the trip. And I have downloaded six, seven different sermons all over an hour long. And I'm sitting there going, I got four hour drive to Elko, perfect. Four hours of preaching. And she kind of goes, <sighs> she'd rather listen to some music, but I, I tell her, well, you want us to wreck? I mean, I need to stay awake. <laughs> And so I was listening to some preaching um, and some interesting things that the preacher was saying. One of them just really got me and made me think about it. He said that when he was first starting out as a pastor, he'd been pastoring for about 12 years. When he was first starting out as a pastor, he said he had the idea that um, God had sanctified him so that he could be the pastor of the church. And God had put him, been sanctifying him and growing him to the point where now he could lead the people. And he said, and after pastoring for many years, he found out that wasn't true. Instead, that God had made him pastor to sanctify him. You know, sometimes I find myself with that same view. And I get frustrated with myself because I say, I'm supposed to be leading these people. How can I have any struggles? How can I have these struggles in life? I'm supposed to be above that. I'm supposed to be sanctified and ready to lead. And then it dawned on me, you know what? God is not just using me as a human. He is using the role of pastor to grow me, to sanctify me. And I just praise God that he's doing that. And God uses me to sanctify you. And he uses you to sanctify me. And he uses you to sanctify one another. I'm talking about help us to grow. We rub off one another. We, we, we grow. We, we, be, we make mistakes. And then we, we, uh, we sin. And then we confess that. And we move on. And we get this and this. And is this growing process that comes with relationships with one another. And that was one of those moments where I sat there listening and said, hmm, I think I've thought what this pastor has thought before. Another thing he said that was a great encouragement to me was that a pastor has to realize why he is in the ministry in the first place. And immediately my thought goes to, well, I'm here to help people grow. I'm here to, you know, be evangelistic, to serve Christ, to do all these things. And he, he brought out something interesting. He said that if the results is the reason someone is a pastor, they're doing it for the wrong reasons. He said if results is the reason they're a pastor, they're doing it for the wrong reasons. And he was talking about good results too, not bad results. He said if a person is a pastor for any other reason than sheer obedience to God, then they're doing it for the wrong reason. You know, that was a good thing for me to realize and to think about. 
that it's not the results that determines God's direction and God's leading and God's ministry. It's simple, faithful obedience to Him. And it made me realize, you know, I'm the pastor of Grace Baptist Church because I'm being obedient to Him. Not because there's tremendous results or going to be tremendous results or lack of results. But simply out of obedience to God. And those are just a couple of things God, God worked in my life as I was listening to some sermons on my way to, uh, to Elko last week. Um, and so, I thank you for being the tool that God is using to sanctify me, to grow me. We're going to look in Mark chapter 4 about with a short parable that Jesus used here. Verse 26. And he said, So is the kingdom of God as if a man or like a man should cast seed into the ground and should sleep and rise night and day. And the seed should spring up and grow, spring and grow up, he knoweth not how. For the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. But when the fruit is brought forth, or is ripe, immediately he putteth in the sickle, because the harvest is come. What a short, enigmatic parable. <laughs> Here is not a story of a man planting, as in the parable of the sower in the seeds. Here is not a story of, uh, the, uh, as we looked at two weeks ago, uh, well, it was a story of the two debtors and the one who loved more because they've been forgiven more. Here is not a story, like last week you heard, of the uh, man who was forgiven but refused to forgive. But here, it's not really a story. It's simply an agricultural lesson. That's what he basically gives here. This parable is very important. It introduces what I believe to be parables concerning the present kingdom of God. These are parables concerning the present kingdom of God. There will be several we look at here in the next few weeks of these stories with intent. That's what, they're, that's what they are. Stories with a purpose concerning the present kingdom of God. And so to understand this parable, the first thing we need to try to understand is what the present kingdom of God really is. What is the kingdom of God? He says here, the kingdom of God is as if a man, or so is the kingdom of God. Or the kingdom of God is like this. Or this is a good way to describe the kingdom of God. Is what the language is saying here. The kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven found throughout Jesus' teaching are synonymous. He's talking about the same thing. He's talking about the same thing. It's a very interesting phrase that's packed with meaning. John the Dunker, I like to call him that because that's what the word means. John the Baptist, John the Dunker, came preaching repentance for the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is at hand or close by. And Jesus continued that message, but instead of preaching the kingdom of heaven is close by, he described and explained the kingdom of heaven. Sermon on the Mount, the parables, that's what he was doing. He's explaining what it is. John came saying it's coming. Jesus came and said it's here and this is what it's about. And that's what it was. That's how those two work together. God's kingdom, or the kingdom of heaven, can be illustrated with a large circle. Picture in your mind a large circle. All those who have bowed their knee to the king of kings are within that circle. Meaning all those individuals, not churches, all those individuals who have turned from their sin in one movement trusted in Christ. Those that are saved, Christians, true believers. They are within the scope of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven. They are all kingdom dwellers, subjects of the king, right? We would recognize that as Christians, we are the servants of the king of kings. We are his subjects. We're to live in obedience to the king. Now, I find it interesting. Those individuals are in the kingdom of heaven, not religions. Because you can be involved in the most doctrinally rich and organized and perfect religion in the world and still be without the kingdom of God if you have not bowed your knee to the king of kings. In other words, the kingdom of God is not synonymous with the independent Baptists. Okay? You understand I'm saying that. It's not synonymous with the Southern Baptists or the American Baptists. It's not synonymous with, with the Protestants or the Catholics or the Mormons or the Jehovah's Witness. That's not what it's synonymous with. The kingdom of God refers to individuals within the kingdom of heaven, meaning they have bowed their knee to King Jesus. They have trusted in Christ as their Savior. And so who uh, Jesus speaks to when he speaks of the kingdom of heaven, he is speaking of those who have put their faith in Christ. This is what it's like. This is what it is, what it is as if it is this way. This is a simile. Use the word like or as in this parable right here. This is the kingdom of God. Now, Christ rules and reigns as king of his subjects. 
even today.